So today we're going to start talking about um, project and curriculum based, uh, I'm sorry, community based curriculum design. And, and I want to start off by talking about Daniel Pink. Anyone know who Daniel Pink is? Yeah, Daniel Pink is a writer. Uh, he was a speech writer for, I believe, Vice President Al Gore. Um, he wrote several books um, about uh, psychology, human psychology, and the way that we learn, and motivation, and things like that. And he wrote a book called Drive, which I thought was, uh, it's an excellent book, but it's written primarily for business. But when I read the book, and I heard him speak about it, I thought to myself, man, th the same lessons that he talks about in Drive that are geared towards business apply to education. You know, and so what I started doing was in the Instructors Institute, every year at AWS, I show a video of one of his presentations where he talks about drive. And so today I wanted to actually talk a little bit about some of the things he says in there. Um, he talks about some research that's done on something called the candle problem. Okay? And the candle problem is very simple. Okay? A person walks into a room, okay, and they see a box of tacks a candle, and a book of matches. And they're told, using only the stuff that's on this table, you need to figure out a way to get this candle onto this wall. Okay? And it needs to be on that wall. And so people come in and they all try different things. And you could just imagine, you know, some people are going to be trying to burn the side of the candle and stick it onto the wall. That doesn't work. You know, and, and, and they'll try tacking the candle to the wall, that doesn't work. Eventually what happens is they figure it out. Usually after 10, 15 minutes they start to figure it out. And they figure out that all you really need to do is take the, the, the tacks out of the box and use the box as a means to hold the candle. Okay. Um, so then he started doing some, uh, he started talking about these different experiments that were being done. Uh, one of them was done by a Stanford uh, uh, psychology professor. Um, and, and these, and these, uh, these, these, psych, these psych experiments have been done hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of times, and the results have always been the same. And they're extremely surprising. Uh, he took the candle problem, right? But then he said this, I'm going, to, um, I'm going to make, oh, let's first go over this. The reason the candle problem works the reason the candle problem that, you know, is, is such a problem for people to figure out, why it takes them so long to figure it out, is something that's called functional fixedness. Functional fixedness basically means that when we see something, okay, we're usually limited to understanding how something functions by how it's functioned before. So when we see a box of tax, we don't see that box as anything but something that is holding the tax inside of it. We don't see it as something that can potentially hold the candle. And that's just part of human psychology. Okay? So knowing that this is the problem with why the candle problem works, they then tried to incentivize people. And they broke up in this experiment uh, to two sets of people. Okay? And they said, uh, to the set of people that we're going to incentivize, they said this, we're going to time everyone in this group. Okay? We're going to time you. Okay? And whoever gets the highest time is going to get paid $20, okay? And, 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 you know, it's not a lot of money, but it's also, you know, three, four, five minutes of work. And the other group of people, they just said, we want you to figure out the problem. And the, and the results were extremely surprising. You know, when, when they're faced with the candle problem again, um, the group that was incentivized was able to complete the problem three and a half minutes longer than the group that wasn't incentivized. And so initially when they did this experiment, they said this can't be right. So they went back and did it again and again and again and again. And the experiment has been replicated dozens of times. And every single time that it's done, they find that the higher the incentive to the individual, the longer or the poorer their performance. Now this flies in the face of everything that we understand about business. Because in business, the way that we incentivize employees 
is by giving them a raise, by giving them a new title, a bigger office, an expense account. But if these experiments are accurate, and we know they're accurate because of how often they've been replicated, the more the incentive that I give you, the poorer your performance is going to be. And so what's really interesting to me is that the same thing can be true for education. And in the end, it all comes down to a very simple. Our whole system of motivating people, whether it's in business, or in education is wrong. The reason is because when you're paying someone, when you're incentivizing them with something like money, okay, you're using a form of motivation called extrinsic motivation. Extrinsic motivation is motivation that comes from outside of the individual. Okay, so I tell you, hey, if you come to this lecture today, I'm going to give you $20. Okay, so your motivation for coming to the lecture today, getting out of bed early before the show even opens, is because you are going to get these $20. That's extrinsic motivation, okay? We do this in school all the time, except we don't use money. We use grades. We tell you, if you work hard, if you study, if you do everything we tell you to do, we're going to give you an A. It's also known as the carrot and the stick. You do well, you know, you're going to get the A. You're on a donkey, how do you motivate the donkey? Well, you can motivate him either by dangling a carrot in front of him and getting him to walk trying to get to that carrot, or you can hit him with a stick, very much like a student. Because if you think about it, to a student, grades are the same type of motivation that a bonus is to an employee. The problem with, that, with extrinsic motivation is that it relies solely on positive and negative feedback. Now let's, let's make a connection here between something that we talked about yesterday and something we're talking about now. Positive and negative feedback work in education, why? Because our system is based on behaviorism. The modern system of education is based on behaviorist theory. That a person's behavior only changes as they receive positive and negative feedback and become conditioned until, be, until physical behavioral, permanent behavioral change occurs. You know? And the way we do this in education is to think through things like grades and a diploma. When I talked about the MIT open courseware yesterday, does anyone remember exactly how I phrased it? Because I always phrase it in a very particular way. I said, you can get an MIT education, anyone can get an MIT education for free, but what's the one thing you don't get? The diploma because that becomes the extrinsic motivation once you get past the high school level, really. It's all about that piece of paper, that external validation, okay? And so the idea here is that we can, and if you think about the way that, that we quote unquote incentivize students, is that we will often because we're limited in the way that we can have negative feedback. I mean, I don't know about your school districts, but I'm pretty sure that they're not gonna allow me to electrocute students. They're, you're gonna have to use the idea of the repetition of a grade or extra work or detention as, an, as a form of creating a negative feedback. And so what happens is that those same negative motivational tools that you're using, that negative feedback, it just creates a cycle in which the negative feedback, instead of improving the behavior, instead of changing the behavior, is going to only further drive the student towards that negative behavior. And so 
this is what Daniel Pink says in, uh, in one of the presentations I watched. He said, what worries me is that too many organizations are making their decisions, their policies about talent and people based on assumptions. And that is the key there. Based on assumptions that are outdated, unexamined, and rooted more in folklore than in science. And this is one of the things that baffles me. Because I consider myself a man of science. I consider myself a person who tries to understand the world from a scientific basis. I don't understand how we can keep going on a day-to-day -day basis completely ignoring the avalanche of science that's showing us that the way that we're trying to motivate students, it's just dead wrong. And so if we can't motivate them extrinsically, how do we motivate them? We motivate them with intrinsic motivation, which is motivation that comes from the inside of the individual. So when we tell students, you have to go to math class, because if you don't, you're going to get an F, and they don't want to be in math class, what are they going to be doing? Thinking about welding. Thinking about welding. <laughs> What I find interesting about this is that forget about the science. Let's just forget about the science for a second. If you just think about it logically, you just think about you as an individual, why would we think our students are any different than we are? You can only get people, I mean, everyone's going to have a price. You know, the reason kids go to school is because they have to. <laughs> they don't, most of them don't do it by choice. They have to. They know that they have to get a college, uh, high school education. Some of them know that they have to get a college education to do whatever it is they want to do in life. They don't do it because they want to do it. It's not, intrinsic, it's not an intrinsic motivation for them to just go to school. But for some of them it is. And it can be. And then that's the difference okay, between teachers that are really connecting with their students and teachers that are there collecting a paycheck is who are those teachers that can intrinsically motivate their students to do it. So let's talk a little bit about intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation is all based on the idea that the individual is getting pleasure or satisfaction by doing something. If this was the third day of the conference and every one of these presentations was boring to all hell and you weren't learning anything, I don't think we'd have anyone in this room. Because even though you may have had that intrinsic motivation to come here initially, the moment that you see that you're not gaining anything from it, that you're not taking any pleasure or satisfaction as an individual from it, you just stop coming. Furthermore, in many ways, intrinsic motivation is all about the drive to explore to understand something, to discover something. Let's go back to yesterday morning when we talked about designing better lesson plans with better classes. What did we talk about? Changing the idea of learning in the classroom to what? To discovery. To allowing students to discover things. To allow it to be interesting. To allow them to have more intrinsic motivation in what they're doing. This is a great quote by uh, Maria Montessori, who obviously set up all the Montessori programs. Uh, she said, the greatest sign of success for a teacher is to be able to say that children are now working as though I did not exist. A teacher that is invisible in the classroom, a teacher that is there just to facilitate, just to help, just to answer questions, just to make sure they're on task. A teacher doesn't have to force his students to do anything those are the most effective teachers because then those students are motivating themselves. And really, you could say this about any form of leadership. Going back to what, what Mr. Tim Lawrence was talking about during uh, his award lecture uh, on Tuesday. You know, leadership is being able to motivate people to work at their best. Since the 1970s, countless studies have shown that intrinsic motivation produces higher academic achievement than extrinsic motivation. So now we're, we're going beyond the, these are David's thoughts, these are David's opinions, 
you know, these can be debated, I don't agree with him. Now we're talking about the simple fact that there are countless studies that have shown this to apply to the field of education. And so one of the things I want to talk about uh, is uh, constructionist learning theory, which is um, something that I think can be very easily applied in the welding classroom, <coughs> but is, is very often ignored. You had a question. Uh, actually, a comment. I, I figured this out about 15 years ago, seven years into my high school teaching. Mm -hmm. Students were cheating, pulling welds out of the scrap bin and turning <laughs> somebody else's work. So what I did is my seventh year, I remember this very well, I started out the very first day of the semester, I wrote a dollar sign on the board, first day of class. Kids come in, and I talk money. Okay, welders are making this much money, welders with these skills are making this much money. And I turned it into, you know, how good do you want to be? If you want to be good enough, you're looking at some big dollars. And that's how I started every new class from then on. And the cheating went down. Um, I had to do very little in the way of herding kids. You always get the one that, you know, was forced to be. Yeah, by a absolutely. But it was, it was huge. Absolutely. And that's something that we can discuss even more after the presentation, yeah. you know. Um, we, can, we, can, we can get into those types of, you know, things that we've already done in the classroom. Um, what I'm going to talk about now is just some very basic ideas, you know, very simple things that can be applied to almost any classroom, and also some very grand ideas that are being done right now uh, by other people, just to show you how I think education is changing and some of the things that, that, that these very interesting uh, people that are really trying to change the way we educate people um, are really affecting the field right now. So construction is uh, learning theory, and I just want to briefly go over this, um, is the idea that an individual constructs frameworks of understanding and that the most effective way of doing that is by actually doing something with it, by actually being able to produce something with it. So um, I heard a TED talk not too long ago talking about how we had to change math uh, education in this country. And one of the things that they said in the, in the presentation I thought was very interesting. He showed a bunch of math problems on a blackboard. He said, this is how math looks in a classroom. And then he showed um, some seismic charts. And he's like, this is what math looks like in the real world. <laughs> you know, and, and what I thought was interesting about it was that I could say the same thing about welding. You grab two plates of metal and you say, this is what welding looks like in a classroom. And you go out and you show a car and this is what welding looks like in the real world. And so in many ways, constructionist theory is about being able to link individual learning tasks, every learning task that you're doing, towards a larger goal. And if you remember back yesterday when we talked about lesson planning, what was that first thing that we talked about every lesson? Is having that individual goal that you're trying to reach in every lesson. Well, I want to take that one step farther and say every semester, Every quarter, you need to have an ultimate goal. And you need to remind your students that everything that you're doing is leading to that ultimate goal. How do you do that? We'll get to that in a minute. Part of the reason why this type of education works is that, in my opinion, the opinion of many others, it gives students ownership of their education. Okay? Because they're working towards an ultimate goal, a goal that in many times they themselves have decided, that they themselves have designed and prepped for and are working towards, they have now take, taken ownership over it. You tell a kid, you tell one of your kids, wash my car on Saturday morning, and you're lucky if it's done by 8 o'clock at night. But once that kid gets his first car, a beat-up 1975 gremlin, that has four different paints, you know, color paints on it, that car is spotless. Why? Because it's theirs. They've taken ownership of it. Same thing's true in the classroom. If, you're, if they're working on your project, then they're doing it for your reasons. But if they're working on their project, then all of a sudden they have ownership over what they're doing. Ownership over their own education. One of the great things about uh, constructionist theory is that it allows a lot of time for reflection. 
So the idea is not just you have ownership of what you're doing, right? you're working towards a larger goal, but you're often reflecting on how those individual tasks, how those individual lessons are helping you reach that ultimate goal. So kind of like what you talked about where your ultimate goal was to get paid a certain amount, to be a certain level welder. Okay? Now apply that on a, on, on a monthly basis, on a quarterly basis to your class. Make it a much more attainable goal. And then what happens is that in every class you can reflect. Why is this important? What was one of the rules that we talked about for e-learning yesterday? Always start with the why. And that's really true really for almost any education. We do it and every time we create a class for American Welding Online at AWS, we always try to start off with the why. Why is this course important to you as an individual? How is it gonna be useful to you as an individual? Because then, again, you have the opportunity to take ownership over it. You have an opportunity to reflect on what you learned and why you learned it. One of, the, one of my favorite parts of this, and it's something I briefly mentioned yesterday, is that this kind of, of teaching encourages students to fail. Okay, it encourages them to fail. And I used this example yesterday. For those who didn't hear it, I will say it again. Um, I was watching a video a few weeks ago about one of those light houses that have all those lights, you know, for Christmas that play and match the music, you know, on YouTube. And I called my wife over and I said, look, you got to check this out. And we were watching it and I was smiling and she looks at me and she goes, oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. And I said, yes. We're doing that. And so I started doing research and everything, and I found a bunch of information online in some forums. And she's like, oh, that's not too bad. You can buy a control box to control everything and program it for like 150, 200 bucks. And I said, yes, you could, but you could also build it yourself. She says, you know nothing about you know, electrical engineering. You, got, you've ne you don't even know how a circuit works. And I said, I know, but think about how much fun it's gonna be to learn. You know, and I look forward to banging my head against the wall for eight hours, you know, because I'm stuck on a problem. Because that's how you learn. I recognize that that's how individuals learn. Think about any task that you have learned over the last, I don't know, six months, a year. Think of any, something new you've learned. How many times did you have to fail before you learned how to do it correctly? The problem is that schools are not set up to allow students to fail. If a student fails in school, what happens? They get an F. They get that negative reinforcement. And then what happens with that negative reinforcement? They have to repeat the course. They have to repeat the, the year. They, have to, they can't graduate. And then there are real tangible you know, disincentives to failure. When really, in the end, that failure is what makes it stick. I remember all the way back to seventh grade. In seventh grade, I had a teacher for civics, you know, basically social studies. And my first homework assignment, I turned it in, and I, came, I got it back, and I got a B. And I was like, why the hell did I get a B on this homework assignment? And he circled the word government. And apparently, I had forgotten to write the word, that letter N in government. And I went to him, I said, come on, man. I mean, I just misspelled the word. This is a two-page paper I turned in. And he goes, it doesn't matter. You have to be accurate. You have to know how to spell government. I said, whatever. And I did it again, and I got a C this time. I said, how is it that this time I got a C instead of a B? And he goes, because you didn't learn the first time. And we're going to keep going down until you figure it out. I've never misspelled government again. <laughs> in my entire life, I've never misspelled government. You know, and, and because that failure made it stick. That's how it works. So when we talk about constructionist theory, we're talking about the idea that you're giving kids puzzles. You're giving them problems. You're allowing them to solve it themselves. And any time, any organization, whether you're talking about a welding shop or NASA, they only advance, they only get better because of the fact that they are not afraid to fail. They're not afraid to stick a piece in the wrong part and have to start over again. So part of what I'm talking about, and part of the reason why this is connected directly to project and curriculum-based educational design is because one of the things that we're trying to do, uh, and, and me and several other people in this country are, are having projects and success all around the place, is redefining the classroom. 
What was the one thing I asked you not to forget out of this, this, whole, this whole week of presentation? Somebody please tell me you remember what it was. One thing, yeah. Anyone can learn anything at any time. In the world we live in today, anyone can learn anything at any time. So when we're talking about redefining the classroom, we've always seen the classroom as this. Right? And this grew out of a need to grow as cities. As we became less of an agricultural country and more of a manufacturing country, you know, during the Industrial Revolution, we were packing more and more people into cities. And all these people that were in cities needed somewhere to educate their children. And the reason we wanted to educate these children was to produce better workers, okay, for those manufacturing jobs. And so school, in many ways, is set up like an industry, like, like, a, like, a, like a manufacturing line. You know, it's set up like industry. You pack them in, you go through, everyone's on the same level, everyone learns the same thing, and you just, every year, you just turn them out, just like cars, right? And, and really what we're looking at here when we talk about community-based, you know, educational design, curriculum design, is that we wanna redefine the classroom and open it up and say, you know what? The classroom doesn't have to have four walls around it. The classroom is everything around us. There's an opportunity to learn out there in the world that we don't have sitting in a classroom. So what do we mean? Well, let's look at some of these project-based designs that other people are doing. I'm going to give you two examples and show you what they're doing on a grand scale. And then we're going to talk about how you can do this on a much smaller scale. Anytime you go to shop class, I always thought this was funny. They always ask you to build the birdhouse. You know, that's always like the shop project. W what does any individual ever have to do with a birdhouse? <laughs> Most of these birdhouses get thrown away the moment those kids walk out. And so this is what I call poor implementation of a project-based design curriculum. You know, the intentions are good. The intentions are good. The intentions are we're gonna teach you the skills you need to do this. The problem is that that end goal no one wants to do it. <laughs> so how are those kids going to be motivated to doing it? So I want to talk about something called Project H Design. Okay, if you guys have never heard of Project H Design, they're doing some fascinating stuff. I, I, I thoroughly encourage you to take a look at their website and what they're doing. Um, and Project H Design is two people. You know, and these two individuals uh, moved to this small town, this small town in North Carolina, a very, very rural, very poor town. Um, and they decided that they're going to reopen the shop class there, but they're going to do it a little differently. And so in the shop class, they, tell, they teach the students woodworking. They teach them welding. They teach them all the different skills they need. They teach them design skills. Okay? And basically, what they do from the very beginning is that it's a year-round project. It's a year-round uh, 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 program. And what happens is that during the school year, they first design. Then they build a project, you know, they, they design a project, they learn the skill sets they need, and then during the summer, all those kids get part-time jobs with the school to build those projects, okay? And what they're doing is that they've been building this whole last year, which was the first year they were had, is they're building a farmer's market for the community. They worked with the local government, and they said, hey, we want to build an outdoor farmer's market with only students. Okay, and we want to, you know, we want to build it here. We're going to make it open to the public. We want to give this to the community as a way to improve the community. And the local community said, look, we're going to donate this piece of land right outside of one of our parks. You know, this is government property, and you can build it there. So the students designed this. The students learned the skill sets to do it, and they started to build this farmer's market. Um, in October, on October 1st, the farmer's market was complete. They had a grand unveiling, and it started to become a functional space for the people using it, for the community. And now there is an outdoor farmer's market in that area. And part of what they're doing is called integrated curriculum. You know, because in order to build something like that, you need to know more than just welding. You need to know more than just how to nail a piece of board you know, to another, to another piece of wood. You need to understand math. You need to understand, 
you know, physics. You need to understand, understand design. And so what they were able to do is they were able to work with the school system to ensure that these kids are learning these different skills and that they're getting these skills in the classroom and that they're getting credit for it. I want to mention another foundation called the Sweetwater Foundation. What the Sweetwater Foundation does, and, and they don't work directly for a school, what they do is that they build aquaponics centers in communities. Okay? And these aquaponics centers are built and run by the people in the community in order to build, to, to grow organic food that then becomes available to the community. Especially in areas where you cannot get organic food, or organic food is very difficult or very expensive to get. And so the idea is we're gonna use the community to help build this and run this, and we're gonna teach a variety of things, biology, you know, um, agricultural skills. We're teaching people uh, uh, building skills, how to build things, you know, and Eventually, you know, you're talking about everything here. You know, you're talking about animal husbandry as you're dealing with the fish farms in there. And the community, after they build all these greenhouses, um, and they work a lot with schools and kids and families that come in here and work with them and learn these skills, uh, then partake in the harvesting of everything. They partake in every aspect of this. And so what happens is that you're taking the classroom outside of the book. You're saying, we're teaching you these skill sets. You're learning all these things, but it's not really learning in the way that you had to always learn. You know? Imagine if I told you today, you, know, you can learn everything you needed to learn in school, but in a practical way, by actually doing it. Instead of learning biology in a classroom, you're actually learning biology by doing it. You're actually learning biology by understanding all these different aspects that go into this project. This is a, uh, a class project, a welding class project that a welding school did. They worked with the community, call, uh, I'm sorry, the local community, and they said, we want the end goal for our welding class to be sculptures that we develop for parks as a way to beautify the community, you know, as a way to make the community nicer, areas nicer. I mentioned this yesterday slightly, but it doesn't need to go, it doesn't just need to be something like a sculpture. It doesn't need to be as something as grand as an aquaponics plant, even though that's what we're precisely right now trying to do in Miami, is to design that same aquaponics system at a high school with the welding program. And have the welding program responsible for building everything in there. And then we have those same students learning other skills. So right now we're working with the city, I'm sorry, with the, with the Miami-Dade um, uh, school system to try to get them to give the students credits for other courses, maths and sciences, for participating in this project over a long-term period of time, over a two-year period of time, but also by teaching them the skills necessary to weld everything together and maintain it. So, you know, it, it's as simple as saying, look, we're going to, in this course, pick a project that we're going to do this semester. We're going to weld some benches for the park. We're going to build, weld some barbecues for the park. Because now every time that student passes that park, every time that student sees that, there's going to be a sense of pride in the community. There's going to be a sense of, I helped do that. And then every student that comes after that student knows that in that class, in that welding program, that they have a purpose. That it's something more than just getting a grade. That we're doing this to help the community to make it better. And then go one step further. Go out to the community leaders, to the politicians. Tell them what you want to do. Get them to help you. Get industry in the area to help fund these projects. Because what happens is that the moment you start doing this for something other than yourselves, other than your school, as soon as you start involving the community, you're gonna start seeing that people are gonna be more than willing to come out and support what you're doing. If doing something for the community is too beyond what you're capable of doing, what I would suggest is this. Design individual projects, practical projects. Not just we're gonna weld this box. Give them a practical project 
as an end goal. Bring it in the first day of class and say, by the end of this semester, you guys are going to each weld one of these, a barbecue. That's going to be yours. You're going to take it home. That's going to be your final project. So our goal this semester is going to be to get the skill sets we need to do this final project. You know, go do something else. You know, how many people in their schools also have an auto body shop or, or an auto program connected to the school? Work with the auto pro, uh, program to do some welding for them. Why not? It's there. Now all of a sudden you're teaching welding in a practical application. You're showing them how they could use this welding. If you have no idea what kind of projects you can do, contact the major manufacturers. Contact Lincoln, contact Miller, Aesop. They have tons of these projects that they'll be more than willing to just hand over to you, the specs for. And say, here, use it in the classroom, absolutely. There's books of these projects that are available. <clears throat> Go find it on the internet. I guarantee you that you'll find thousands of them, because I did. And what happens is that now we're using that constructionist theory. We're building a project-based curriculum where the end goal is that the student is intrinsically motivated to do something that's going to better them as an individual, but also allow them to reach a goal that they want to reach. Sometimes that end goal doesn't necessarily just have to be a project. One of, the, one, of the, one of the fun things that I kept hearing at different places where I go to sections is that they all have, you know, a lot of schools try to have welding contests. I believe Jimmy's section, you guys have a weld off between teachers and students, right? Yes. Absolutely. That's great. You know, um, back in my high school, every year, during homecoming, the most popular event was the senior faculty basketball game, in which the entire school packed into the basketball arena, you know, and there was a game between some of the seniors and the faculty. Oh my God, that was like the highlight of the year. Everyone loved that, because you got a chance to go up against your teachers, you know? You got a chance to embarrass them. <laughs> really is what it comes down to. You know, have a weld off between the teachers and the students. You know, there are great organizations out there that are doing great things like the SkillsUSA. You know, SkillsUSA is having those contests. We just had a silver medal winner in the world competition. You know, go out there and start supporting SkillsUSA. Participate in those competitions. Get your kids involved in it. Let them see what they can do. Hey, listen, you can, you can work your way up the ladder from regional to state to nationals to world. You can, you can be chosen to select, you can be chosen to represent the United States of America as the top student welder versus other countries, which is a once in a lifetime opportunity. You, you can represent the state, you can represent the region in this. You know, again, this is different forms of intrinsic motivation, all right? Different ways of getting students, even though it's not a physical goal, it now becomes a tangible goal because they know that at the end of the year or at a certain point of the year, they're going to this competition. You know, so there's something more in it for them than just a grade. Okay? Um, this is something that we're trying to do with American Welding Online, is that we're trying to get students more involved in different things. And so over the next coming months, I encourage you guys to keep, to keep looking at American Welding Online. We're going to be putting up a lot more information up there for you. Uh, that you can use in your classrooms, that you can use with parents, that you can use with students, that you can use with the guidance counselors, with the other, with the other faculty, with the middle schools in your area, to help you generate interest in what you're doing, but also to give you more ideas. And, and, and throughout this, we're going to be offering all sorts of free e-seminars and, and workshops and things like that for, for teachers. And also, we just want to increase accessibility to educational content for you. Um, I'm going to actually move ahead a little bit here. Uh, we talked about a little bit about the Sense Online program earlier. 
Um, that you're going to be receiving more information on that in the next uh, probably six weeks for all the sense schools out there. And basically, what we're doing is we're taking the entire sense program online. And, and part of the reason why we're doing this is because it's easier for us to communicate with students. It's going to be easier for students to get behind the sense program, to get excited about the sense program when they could see on a daily basis their advancement through the program. They could see that tangible goal at the end. So I want to ask a simple question here. How would you rate, or how would you rate the state of the welding education right now in the United States? We talked about a little of some of these statistics earlier in the week. Right now, the average age of a welder in the United States is 54. Now, we have a shortage of 200,000 qualified welders in the United States as of last year. Okay? We have 50,000 welders retiring every year and only 25,000 new students entering into the welding uh, industry or welding courses every year. So when you look at 2011 alone, Right now, we're estimating, or, or the United States uh, Department of Commerce uh, has estimated there's about half a million welders in the United States. If 50,000 of them retire this year, and we only get 25,000 new workers to replace them, uh, what's going to happen is we're going to lose, we're going to have a net loss of 25,000 skilled welders in the US in this year alone. Now, multiply that out to 2015 to 2020, and what you see is that over a 10-year period, you're going to lose 50% of the workforce. So I, I would not rate the state of welding in the United States as being very healthy right now, especially welding education, um, because the truth of the matter is that more and more of what we do, as we talked yesterday about the Bay Bridge, is being outsourced to other countries. And so when you look at the state of what we're doing, I want to ask you a simple question. What are you doing right now to promote your welding programs? Because ultimately, this is a problem that affects all of us. It doesn't just affect him or him or him. <clears throat> it affects everyone in the industry. And so we all have to get involved. And, and so what I'm going to leave you with in these last uh, few minutes that I have is some of the things that you can do to help promote your program. And also, more importantly, I think, is to build interest in it. Because the idea is not to just get kids to sign up. You know, If you want kids to sign up for your class, just have a pretty girl in a bikini you know, outside handing out flyers. <laughs> the idea is to get them interested enough to graduate your program, to become welders. All right, and so this is, um, this is the triangle of sales. All right, so this is basic selling theory. You know, um, anytime you're trying to get someone to buy something, it's a four step approach. Okay, first you have to build awareness. You have to let them know, hey, this is available to you. Then you have to build their interest, which shouldn't be too hard, again, you get to cut metal with fire. That should be enough to get anyone interested in this. I will let you do things and play with arcs that are as hot as the sun. That's enough to get anyone interested in it. But the hard jump becomes when you're trying to go from interest to desire. How do you make people who are interested in something actually sign up? That's the hardest part. Ask any car salesman. Because the commercials promote the, in, the awareness. When you get in there, the car salesman is telling you, hey, look at all these features. Look at all these things you can get. Look at how nice it is. Look at how good you look in that car. But it's a big jump to go from, hey, I'm interested, to actually, I want it. But it's an even bigger jump to go from, I want it, to I'm actually going to do it. You know. This is, what I li this is what I like to say. I use this term all the time with, with, with our developers at AWS with the team. I tell them that's a good problem to have. If I had to choose a problem between having people that are not interested and having too much interest and not enough funding, I'd rather have that. And I got to tell you that I think you're in the minority in that. Um, 
as I travel around the US, I get a lot of, we have the funding to do it. Don't send, send but we don't have, <laughs> but we don't have the students who want to do it. Uh, but in, in that case, where you have the funding, or where you don't have the funding, don't have you don't have the money, you got to go straight to the school district. No, you got to plead your college. case. I'm at college, I get state money, they're whacking the. the yes, all, and that's something that's affecting everybody. And every program. And that's not just welding. That's every program. And, and that's something that Dr. Chin talked about in his speech um, yesterday, you know, or the day before yesterday, is, is, you know, when he's talking about the fact that you know, the lack of funding for state colleges and universities is really making it difficult to continue programs at that level. Um, we have a similar issue in South Florida. I'm gonna tell you how, I'm gonna tell you in a second how, we get, how we're trying to get around that, how we're trying to work with that. I don't mean to sidetrack you, but- No, 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 I agree, I, I agree and I understand that pro problem because we have it down in South Florida with some of our schools. So one of the things that, that I propose that you need to do is that you need to start building partnerships between the school, the community, and the industry. You know, because uh, it, before, you know, before we became so, such an industrialized nation, the school in many ways was a center point of the community. It was usually a building that was used for many things, you know, outside of just educating kids during the day. You know, and, and, and over time we've lost that. And so we need to start reforming the school as a center point in the community. We need to go out and form a partnership, communicate, you know, go out and tell the students what your program's about, what it is they can learn in your program, what are the opportunities for them. And I know most of you probably already do this, but you need to take it a step further. Meet with the parents. Every school has a parents' night. You need to hound whoever runs that to let you speak for five minutes. You need a presentation? Let me know and I'll send you one. Okay? Meet with the guidance counselors. This is the reason why we have a guidance counselor program the first day of the education program. The guidance counselors are one of the biggest problems that we have in this industry. Why? There's a misconception that welding is a dirty job. It's a job that no one wants to do. You know, it's a job that's dangerous. You know, and that, that, that it's only for lower class people. You know, and the truth of the matter is that welding is no longer that in many ways. And that there's a lot of opportunities for growth in there. People always think that a welder, once you become a welder, you're always gonna be a welder. People don't think about the fact that welders can become inspectors and engineers and quality control people. You know, they can become supervisors and managers of plants. You know, and there's a lot of opportunities out there for individuals to grow beyond just being under a hood your entire career. You know, meet with the industry. You know, a lot of schools are now starting to partner up with industry in their area to get scrap metal. You know, to say, hey, any of your scrap metal, instead of just selling it off, donate it to the school. Remember, industry gets to write it off as a tax, you know, as, as, a, as a tax write-off. So they get a benefit for it also. You know, give a call to, 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 to anyone in your area. If, if Miller or Lincoln, you know, or ESOB has a manufacturing plant in your area or a major distributor in your area, give them a call. See what they can help you out with. Because everything they give you ultimately benefits them in the end as a tax write-off anyway. And so this is the idea of partnering everyone together. And then here's the key. If you can show them that everything you're doing is towards this project that's going to benefit the community in the long run, and there's a way where they can get free press by donating to you in the local papers, that's just even a further incentive for them to join into that triangle. Okay, because now they're involved in betterment of the community. And so now you have that triangle formed where industry, school, and parents, everyone's working towards a common goal that goes beyond just basic education of students. You know, I always like to show this chart because this is what it's about. You need to show, you need to look at what you want as an instructor, what students are interested in, and that area where they overlap, that's the key. That's where you have to attack. That's what you have to focus on. You know, and, and welding is an easy thing to sell. I mean, th there's so much excitement in welding. The idea that you can weld underwater, the idea that we can weld in outer space, okay, the idea that 
right now in the middle of a major economic crisis, we have 200,000 open welding jobs in the United States. You know, I find this fascinating, these statistics. 81% of manufacturers say they can't find skilled workers. 81% of manufacturers say they cannot find skilled workers in the United States. I go to a parent-teacher meeting or one of those things in a school, and I tell them, yes, absolutely, you can spend $80,000 to get your kid a degree in English literature from a college that's going to qualify them to basically teach English literature. Saying this as someone who has a degree in English literature. <laughs> But you have a major opportunity here to prepare your students, your sons, your daughters for jobs that are in demand in this country that, where the demand's only going to grow. 60% of manufacturers say that they reject half of all applicants as being unqualified. This is, the, this is the stat that I keep, uh, that, that always gets the best reaction. You want it, uh, obviously, any of my presentations that you want, just let me know and I'll, I'll send it out to you. Um, but I love showing this slide, and I've gotten great reaction from people when I show this. The average wage for an entry-level welder in the United States is $16 an hour. Okay, this is $16 an hour as entry-level. We're not even talking now two-year technical degree. Right. Compare that to other entry-level jobs in the United States. This is the United States uh, Department of Commerce. Okay. They're getting paid more than medical assistants, more than customer service reps, more than accounting clerks. This is a job that you can already enter making more than some of your teachers that taught you how to weld in the first place. I encourage you guys, if you haven't yet, to go to the AWS website, go to the foundation site, take a look at some of the materials I passed out now. You can go on there and you can re request all sorts of things that they'll send you. You know, we even have an Iron Man comic book, you know, that we, that we geared towards younger kids. You laugh, but to my daughter's school, I took them a whole box. And I passed it out and all the kids were like, oh, a free comic book, great. And they're going to read it. And guess what? They're going to learn about welding. They're ultimately doing what I need them to do anyway, in a very indirect way. You know, take a look at the jobs and welding website if you haven't yet. Show it to parents. Let them see how many jobs in their area are waiting for them, around the US. The opportunity that these kids are gonna have to travel, to go to different places, to weld, and get paid really well to do so. You know, go to the careers and welding website. There's a wealth of information there. As I, as I mentioned, you can, or, you can order all sorts of collateral from AWS. They'll send it out to you for free, however much you need. One of the great ideas that, that actually came out of Jimmy's section also that I heard that I've been telling other section is that they do a welding day, I think. Was that your section? No, that's a good idea. Oh, so it, it must have been another section that gave me this idea. They do a welding day. They say, hey, you have anything at home you need welded, our welding instructors are going to be out there. They'll weld it for you for free. As long as it takes less than an hour to do, we'll weld it free for free. And they got all the welding instructors, they get some people from the industry out there, they make it like a little fair. You know? And what happens is that all of a sudden you have a booth there, you're giving out all the collateral, you're letting the parents know, hey, these are things that you could do. You have a booth where the kids can come out and play with the welding, you know, with, with a welder. You can actually teach some welding. You, know, you, you set them with an oxy fuel torch, you teach them some basic oxy fuel there. You let them weld a little. You know, if you can get AWS to, to, you know, or, or maybe one of the, the local uh, uh, manufacturers or distributors to get out there with a VR machine, you can set up a VR machine out there. You know? and, and the idea is you're creating awareness, which is the first step. And through that awareness, you start to create desire to actually be in the program. You know? One of the things I strongly suggest is that if right now you do not have a student chapter of AWS in your area, set up a student chapter of AWS in your area. Okay? Because those students, again, it's that greater connection, that idea that there's always growth, there's always opportunity, that you're not, only going, you're not going to only be under a hood for the rest of your career. That just, there's a lot of things in welding you can grow and do. 
you know. And so there's a great many things that you could do as individuals to grow interest in your welding program, right? Not just in the way we design it, right? But in the way that we actually go out and talk to the community, to the industry, to the parents, to the students about it. Thank you, guys.